There's something. <laughs> Get us going here. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining today's wellness lecture. We have a very special guest with us today to talk to us about brain health and where we are trending as a community and what you can do about it. Before we get started, if you are a TGH team member, make sure that you place your full name and your badge ID into the Q&A so that you're able to get your credit for being here today if you are on a shared device or calling in today. As well, please, please place all questions uh, and engagement in the Q&A, and I can relay those to Heather at the end of the presentation. And hang on one second, let me pull up. I want to announce our special guest um, properly. So Heather, she is the founder and creator of Brain Health Mentors. Heather has a speech language, speech language, has been a speech language, language pathologist for 24 years. I apologize, that is a mouthful for me. <laughs> and is also a certified health and wellness coach. And Heather began to notice the positive shift in the studies emerging in the field of brain health and dementia. She immediately took a year long research sabbatical to create what is now the Brain Health Mentors Program. So without further ado, I am gonna hand it over to Miss Heather Elwell. Thank you so much. And before we get started, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Tampa General Hospital. You impact our community in such an amazing way, and you have taken care um, of some dear friends of mine during really, really challenging times um, in their life. One of my good friends, her son had a spinal cord injury, and TGH took very good care of this sweet family, and their son is now graduated. Um, from college and had a wonderful college experience. I have another dear friend of mine whose husband, they were very worried that he would lose vision in both eyes and TGH took really good care of him and he's back to working full time, coaching his son's sports teams. Um, so I just want to thank you um, from a personal level for what you've done for my friends, but also um, for the community. You have no idea the kind words um, that you say and the sweet gestures that you make, um, how people that have, you know, not just the patients, um, but the patients' families as well, how they like to share that in the community. So truly, um, these little acts of kindness um, have a butterfly effect. And so I just want to thank you all um, for your service. I know it's it's a team effort, so thank you all um, for what you do. And I also just want to thank the Tampa Well Program. I think what you're doing in the community is fantastic, and I am just so excited um, to be a part of this and getting out this information to our community. Okay, I have three main objectives today. The first is I want to change the age stigma in regards to brain health. It's traditionally been seen as an older person thing. And what it what it is, is it's something for all adults. I have two teenage daughters at home. Brain health is just as important for them as it is my parents who are in their mid 70s. Brain health is for everyone. Just like we know our physical health is very important. That's the way we need to view our brain health as well. It's something for all people. The second thing I want to do is to provide hope in what has traditionally been seen as a hopeless situation. The third thing I would like to do today is inspire you, motivate you, empower you to share some of the things you've learned today with your patients, your friends, and the community as well. Okay, what I'd like to do really quickly is kind of have a state of the union as to in terms of where we are right now. From 2010 to 2019, HIV went down 65%, which is wonderful, incredible news. Heart disease went down 7.3%. Strokes went down 10.5%. This is great news. What do we think has happened in terms of Alzheimer's disease? I'm going to give you three seconds to think about what you think has happened. Do you think it has gone up or down? If so, how much? Alzheimer's has increased 145%. 
What I'd like to do right now is to show you how this truly impacts all of us. Two times. Black Americans are two times more likely to develop dementia. 1.5 times. Hispanic Americans are 1.5 times more likely to develop dementia. Right now, one out of three seniors dies with dementia. Two thirds. Two thirds of the people with dementia are women. Two thirds of the caregivers of people with dementia are also women. Blue Cross Blue Shield came out with a report in early 2020 that looked back on past years. And what they found was from between 2013 and 2017, there was a 373% increase in cases of dementia of people ages 30 to 44 years of age. Also in early 2020, it was estimated that by 2025, Florida would see a 24% increase in cases of dementia. I wanna point out that timeline again. I said early 2020, it was January or February of 2020. So that was before the impact of COVID and the impacts that can have on our brain health. That was before isolation and, and people staying at home. And that was also prior to the great migration of people moving to the state of Florida. Dementia impacts everyone. If you don't mind, I'd like to just take one moment to tell you how it's impacted me. This is my beloved Nana, Margaret Davis. She had an extraordinary life, was married for 55 years. Uh, when my grandfather retired, they just, they had a beautiful retirement. They traveled all over the world. They went to church each week. Um, she volunteered, he played golf. She'd get together with friends. It was a beautiful retirement. Unfortunately, when my grandfather got sick, the last two years of his life, she slowly cut her community ties. She stopped going to church. She stopped volunteering and she stopped getting together with friends. When my grandfather passed away, she was so grief stricken that she did not reach back out. She did not go back to church. She no longer volunteered and she stayed at home because she was so grief stricken. The information I'm gonna share with you today, I wish I would have had 20 years ago. There were just simply things that we did not know then. So I will tell you, it is too late for my, for my Nana who developed dementia, but it is not too late for you and your family. Brain changes that lead to dementia can occur 20 to 30 years prior to a diagnosis. That's why it is so important that we are all working on our brain health. I'd like to talk about some of the risk factors. This is not a complete list, but just a, you know, a, a snapshot of some of the things that we're looking at that put us at, at a greater risk. Diabetes can triple our risk of dementia. Heart disease significantly increases our risk of depression or uh, of dementia. Depression and grief also significantly increase that risk. Loneliness. I have seen statistics from 27% to 64% to the fact that it can triple your risk of dementia. So I just want to take one moment, one pause right here. Life is full of recalibrations. I just told you how my Nana had a really hard time recalibrating. You might have a friend right now that's going through a recalibration. Maybe it's been a change in, in the workplace. Maybe it's been a divorce or a significant other that has passed away. Maybe you have a friend whose children are, are you know, have just left for college or are gonna be leaving for college soon. Life is full of so many recalibrations. So today, as I'm giving this presentation, if you can just think of one person you could reach out to today to text um, or, or give a phone call to or ask out um, for coffee or to happy hour, I just encourage you to think about someone that you could reach out to today. Okay, hearing and vision difficulties. There's been a lot of research recently um, that talks about hearing loss in midlife and how that's one of the biggest predictors of dementia. So I, I really, really want to encourage you if you have a, a loved one or you're starting to have some hearing difficulties yourself, please, please go get hearing aids. Don't miss it. 
Don't miss your children or your grandchildren's voices. Don't miss the invitations or the funny things your friends might say. Don't miss it. Please, please, please go to, go to an audiologist. And if you need hearing aids, please get them. Um, vision is another area. I'll be honest with you. I am a reluctant contact wearer. Um, I had three pairs of glasses. I couldn't read text messages. And it was, it was my mother um, that gave me a nudge. And she finally said, Heather, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. You can't read your text messages. You've got glasses all over the place. It's time to get contacts. And I, I have to tell you, I'm so grateful that my mom gave me that nudge because now I feel like I've got 20 year old eyes. I can see far away. I can see up close. It, it really has, I didn't realize how annoyed I was getting throughout the day. So I just wanna encourage you, take care of yourself. Now here's the wonderful thing. Here's the hope today. Lifestyle modifications can reduce our risk of getting dementia. And I just want to cite two sources on this. Um, in 2020, the Lancet um, came out with an article that 40% of dementia cases are preventable. Um, the Journal of Amer the, the JAMA, um, Journal of the American Medical Association in July of 22 also came out um, with a study saying 41% of dementia cases are attributed to modifiable lifestyle factors. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And that's what I wish I would have had so many years ago that I could have shared with my sweet Nana. Walking, exercise, and nature. The way we need to think about exercise is that it's like miracle grow for our brain. We have this neurogenesis happening, this creation of new brain cells every time we exercise. There was a really interesting, um, cute article that came out recently that talked about this unbelievable treatment for Alzheimer's disease and how it could reduce your risk by 50%. Well, you get to the end of the article and it talked about that walking 10,000 steps a day can and re reduce your risk of dementia by 50%. That's better than any medication on the market right now. There was an article done several years ago that looked at men ages 71 to 93. And what they found was men that walked two miles a day that were 71 to 93 years of age reduced their risk of dementia by 77%. That's incredible. So just simply taking a walk in nature every day can help reduce your risk. Nutrition and hydration. I'm not going to spend too long on this because we all know these things, right? We're talking these, you know, starting in elementary school. We know we need to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. My question to you is, are you doing that? Um, are you spending more time in the produce section of the grocery store than you are down the aisles where there's all this processed food? My other question is, how do you feel? How do you feel after eating a meal out versus a meal you cook at home? Pay attention to how your what your body is telling you when you're having different foods. Hydration. I am really surprised how many people are not getting, you know, eight glasses of water a day. You would be surprised how many people I talk to when I ask them how much water they're drinking in a day and they'll tell me a glass or two glasses. Um, I will also have people that tell me they're drinking eight glasses of water a day, but they're also having three cups of coffee, four cups of coffee, and, you know, three glasses of wine. Let's just be intentional and mindful about what we're consuming, and let's pay attention to what our body is trying to tell us when we're consuming food and the, the drinks that we've talked about. I will tell you personally um, that I have found, um, I don't really drink alcohol that much um, anymore. I don't drink it at home. If I'm going out and I'm out with friends, now I know I can have one glass of wine. If I have another glass of wine, I, my brain is truly, it's trash the next day. I absolutely have difficulty with word finding. I don't feel as clear. So I just encourage you to pay attention to what's happening. Pay attention to what your body is trying to tell you. Schedule and sleep. This is so important. That sweet spot is seven to eight hours of sleep a night. Um, surprisingly, when I developed this program, I thought the majority of people that I would be working with would be people in retirement. And that is not at all what has happened. It's actually the majority of people coming to me are in their 40s and 50s. And what I found is a lot of them are not getting adequate sleep. 
we need to think about sleep as that's when the pressure washer goes in, right? That's when the cleaning crew goes in and cleans up all the gunk that's in our brain. Would you ever have a cleaning crew come to your place of business or to your home and with an hour left of work to do, say, it's OK, you can go now, right? We, we would never do that in real life, but that's what we're doing when we're getting six hours of sleep a night. And I have found those of you that are in your working years, some of you have kids at home, you're not getting enough sleep. The majority of you are getting about six hours of sleep a night. And a lot of, I will say, a lot of moms, that's their catch up time. They feel like they put, they finish all the things they need to do. The kids are in bed and that's their magic time to their self. And what you're doing is you're robbing yourself. You're robbing your brain of that time to clean itself. So please try and find that me time, a different part of your day. Do not rob your sleep to get that time alone that you need. Um, also, I have a lot of older adults that are sleeping maybe nine or 10 hours of sleep a night. That's not good either because our brain needs that stimulation. We need to be in community, be with others, stimulating our brain. It's not good if we're sleeping too long. So aim for seven, eight hours of sleep a night. Those of you that are in your working years, um, I'm sure have a very busy schedule right now. And it's good. It's good for us to have structure to our days. The problem is sometimes when we retire, we have a lot of open ended time. It's really imp important that we have a purpose to our day, that we have a plan to our day, especially in retirement. Um, there were some very scary statistics I've recently come across. Um, that retirees are spending anywhere on average from 43 to 47 hours um, a week watching television. That is not good to have that kind of open-ended time. We need to have schedule to our day. We need to have purpose to our day. It's great to try something new and challenging. That's so good for our brain health. So whether it's learning a new language or playing a new instrument, um, trying out new things. I'll be honest with you, um, this year I went to a class in town and it was like a series of classes where you learn to, you learn to uh, paint. And what I realized is that was not for me. I had a wonderful time. But that was that was not for me and that's OK. We want to try things and if it doesn't work, let's try something else. I also tried out pickleball and let me tell you, if you guys have not played pickleball, like just learning the scoring for pickleball is a great brain workout. So I just encourage you. Is there a new sport you can try? What are things that you can do that are new to your brain and also a source of meeting new people as well? A friend funnel. OK, I'm going to just take a minute to to talk about mild cognitive impairment. I'm going to keep this very simple because, quite frankly, I could, I could talk about mild cognitive impairment for three hours um, just about that. Um, mild cognitive impairment is what is the precursor to dementia. OK, and if we have um, amnestic uh, mild cognitive impairment where we're having trouble with memory and we have difficulty with executive functioning skills, that's a higher conversion to dementia. So for those of you that don't understand or know what executive functioning skills are, um, I have a child with ADHD. So let me tell you, I am well versed in this. I remember when my daughter um, was in elementary school, second and third grade, and she'd bring her homework home and she'd sit in a room and she would just sit there and she just could not get started with her homework. Um, I have people tell me when they're having difficulty with executive functioning skills, things like, Heather, I have so much to do. I just I just can't get started. These are things like taking all these things we need to do and then brain dumping, putting them all down on paper, then prioritizing them, then coming up with a plan and then starting to execute that plan. I'm happy to report because my daughter has had all these years of working on her executive functioning skills. She's doing so much better with that. But I would look to, you know, the older adults in our life and if you start to see maybe things accumulating in the house um, or them not scheduling doctor's appointments, that can kind of be a red flag that they're having difficulty with those executive functioning skills. Okay, repetitive negative thinking. 
can be a, a fast pass to dementia, okay? It absolutely can impact cognitive decline um, and lead to dementia. And I absolutely believe um, when looking at my Nana and the grief that she was going through, I absolutely believe this impacted her. So repetitive negative thinking is getting stuck in this cycle of negative thinking. We all have things that come to us that are negative, but it's when we're, we're just sitting in this space of worry and fear. Um, let me just say, if, if you have a history of depression, I recommend not, you know, coming home after work and watching three hours of, of news like that is that's not good for you. OK, so to identify when this is happening, um, I will tell you, I have definitely experienced repetitive negative thinking and I handled it by going out and, and seeking the help of a psychologist. And I can tell you it was one of the best things I've done. I'm in a much better place because of it. And so is my family. So I would just want to encourage you um, to seek help. When you feel like you need it but i'm also going to give you some other strategies um, to use and you'll see it you know mentioned a couple different ways um, in the research repetitive negative thinking automatic negative thoughts you know both similar things it's just cycling in that that space of worry and fear okay so gratitude isn't this wonderful that you cannot experience fear and gratitude at the same time i love that so I recommend um, to my clients, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you um, that are in patient care, if you ever have a patient's family write you a sweet note, um, hold on to that. Hold on to these sweet notes that patients give you and take the time, maybe starting your day, where before you get into the weeds with everything, that you read some of these sweet things um, that people have written to you to think back on how you've helped families. That's a great thing to start your day with. So gratitude is a wonderful tool. Serving others. All of you that work at TGH, you are serving others every single day, and we are so incredibly grateful for your service. I want to encourage those of you that are looking uh, to the next chapter in retirement to think about ways in which you can serve when you retire. Um, I, quite frankly, have a couple very close friends whose, you know, parents were brain surgeons, you know, orthopedists, and when they went to retire, it's like they just had all this open ended time. So before you retire, think about the next chapter. What causes speak to your heart? What are ways that you think you can get involved in the community? Um, I'm going to brag on my parents for a second. My dad is a retired orthodontist. Um, he lives in Pinellas County. And every single Tuesday, he goes to um, a homeless mission that is in Pinellas County, and he does free dental work. What a wonderful way to use these skills, you know, that he's used in his work life that he can continue in his retirement. My mother, our, our local church, um, does pillowcase dresses, and she loves to sew. So she sews these little pillowcase dresses, and they send them to people around the world um, that need clothing. So what causes speak to your heart, and how can you get involved? involved in that. And if you can make volunteering habitual, you know, if you have a set thing you do each week, that's wonderful in retirement. I know those of you that are in your working years, it's hard, you know, we're juggling a lot. Um, but again, as, as we look at life recalibrations, let, let's look for ways in which we can serve because truly serving is one of the absolute best things that we can do for our brain health. And I want to take another 10 seconds to just share even if you have a family member that has already been diagnosed with dementia, they can still serve. There are still ways in which they can serve. And that gives them purpose. So to really think about something that they could participate in. Um, our church creates these mana bags and it, it has um, like a bottle of water and a granola bar, a clean pair of socks. And actually it's the teenagers um, that prepare these bags. That's something someone with dementia could do. They could help put together bags or something like that. So look, if you have someone in your life that has dementia, please help them find a way in which they can serve. Music. Music is another 
great way to handle if we're having uh, repetitive negative thinking. During the pandemic, I have to say, you know, when all these things were getting canceled and all this fear and stress, one of the things I would do is I would walk around the neighborhood and I would just listen to music. And to, that was one of the things that really kind of brought me back to life. It helped me take my focus off of whatever I was stressed or worried about. So I, I encourage all my working professionals, you know, on, on Monday or before big meetings, you know, or if there's a stressful event happening, have a playlist. Create a playlist that is a wonderful way to kind of take your mind and get your mind prepared for what you have that day. Building a community. This is probably one of the most important things I could talk about today. And I think a lot of it comes from my experience as a speech language pathologist. We want to look for communicative opportunities. It is so important that we are part of large groups, small groups, and we have that individual one-on-one -on -one connection with people. I, I cannot tell you how many people that attended faith-based services prior to the pandemic have still not returned. And I just wanna encourage you, if you're one of those people, I'm gonna encourage you to return because there are so many micro conversations that happen when we're part of a big group. A smile, a wave, eye contact, that recognition. There are so many little micro conversations that occur when we're part of a big community. It's also a great way to discover new friends. Right. It's a wonderful way to have, you know, large group contact, but also connecting with people individually. Um, again, life is full of lots of recalibrations. So I encourage you as life, you know, I, I think about a lot of my friends. Um, I have a daughter that's a junior right now. And um, all of my friends who have sons that are super involved in all these sports, I'm sure it fulfills, you know, a huge portion um, of their time when they're not working. And when these kids go off to college, that's going to be a big shift in their life. Life is full of lots of recalibrations. So let's seek out new things that we can join, new groups that we can be part of. These are things that my Nana didn't do, and I, I really, truly wish I would have had the opportunity to share um, and encourage her to join things, being part of community groups. Um, I spoke at Cafe Contampa. Um, it was about a month ago, and they used to show their, their meetings virtually, and they have stopped doing that as well because they want people to be in community. So is there a neighborhood group you could be part of, a, a working women's group, a, a group that you could golf with? Look for different things that you can do that you can be part of. Also, look around um, with people that you are working with. I have to tell you, I worked at All Children several years ago. Um, I left 16 years ago, and I still get together quarterly with that group of people that I worked with. I have a good friend of mine um, who worked at Denver Children's Hospital with a group of, she was a nurse and she worked with other nurses. She left that job, same thing, probably you know 15 years ago. And she still gets together with a group of women that she met um, every year they go on a girl's trip. So look around where you work. That's a wonderful way to meet people that you can connect with. Um, and who knows, you might have a future best friend um, that's at, at your workplace. Um, I also just wanna say one other thing, living in this community, my children and I, my husband, we used to ride our bikes, you know, every Saturday when the kids were younger to daily eats. And there is nothing that made us happier than seeing a lot of you that work the night shift um, that would all be having brunch together. It, I know you were doing it for you, but I have to tell you as a member of this community, it brought us so much joy as well. So, you know, what are fun things that you can anticipate? Um, and look forward to. Again, we need to look at mindfulness and meditation. Um, those of you in your working years, this is a very stressful time. Practicing meditation has absolutely been proven um, to kind of calm down that, that fight or flight. It helps improve attention and memory. Um, I also love, I just have to say, I love it when I see people walking to Tampa General Hospital. I went for a walk this morning at 7 a.m. and I saw a, a gentleman that was on his way to work on a skateboard. And I have to tell you, huge smile on my face. I, I love those of you that are walking to work or walking home. I think that's great. That's a great way to handle the stress that you're experiencing. I have a sister-in-law who works in the emergency room in Key West, Florida, and she 
she rides her bike to and from work because she feels like it helps her get ready for her work day. And then it also allows her time to decompress before she goes home to her family. So look for opportunities that you can manage stress um, and have some quiet time to yourself. Okay, and then the last thing, what brings you joy? We talked a bit about anticipation. I think, you know, if you want to get together with coworkers and you plan something that evening, what a wonderful thing to anticipate all day. What are fun things that you can anticipate? Make your social life a priority and schedule things. And that way you have these wonderful fun things to look forward to. Do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. So I have one final thought to leave you with today, and it is this. There never was and there never will be another you. God broke the mold when he made you. From your fingerprint, to your personality, to your hobbies and interests, to the things that speak to your heart, there never will be another you. So please, please take care of the precious gift that you are. I just wanted to provide my contact um, information. Um, I do, it, it, people in the community are very sweet. I love to send out emails with little tips um, for things for people to do. And I have to tell you, I've had people uh, come to me around town and say they save all of my emails, which is incredibly sweet and generous. Um, so if you go to my website, you'll see um, a place that you can subscribe. Also, if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, you'll see how I can take the research that's out there and break it down into small little ideas that you can implement. Uh, every day. And I also put on my email address as well. Um, and I, you know what I didn't put on, but uh, if you want to go to my website, it's www.brainhealthmentors.com. And then I put my personal email up there. Um, I would love it if you guys have any feedback or constructive criticism um, of today, feel free um, to email me. Um, I love to continue to, to get better. So I'd love any, any feedback that I have. And that is all. All right. Well, thank you so much, Heather. This was jam packed with wonderful information. And um, I just wanted to mention May is mental health, mental health month. So this was perfect. Um, and I have one question, which I believe you touched on. Um, but if you could maybe name like the top two contributors to uh, dementia, what would those be? Okay, well, I'm going to go back to that list that we have. Okay, so diabetes, heart disease, depression, grief, loneliness, hearing and vision difficulties, especially hearing loss in middle age. Um, and there are some other things as well, um, head injuries, excessive alcohol consumption, exposure to air pollution are also some things as well. But again, some of the big ones, diabetes triples your risk, loneliness we've heard can as much as triple your risk. So this is not an exhaustive list, but um, you see some of the main things there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Heather. And um, like she said, if you have any questions that come up later, please reach out to her or you can always reach out to us at Team Wellness um, at TGH.org and we can direct you to Heather. Um, and thank you all for uh, participating today in this awesome lecture. And I hope everybody has a fabulous day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.